Hey y'all, today we're going to be talking about alcohol. So, just real quick. Uh, so, types of alcohol. Uh, methyl alcohol and ethyl alcohol and isopropyl alcohol. Only one of these is safe to drink. Methanol, which is also known as wood alcohol, is very toxic. Uh, it's also what you would refer to as uh, antifreeze. It can be used as a solvent. It can also be used as a fuel. The reason it's toxic is because uh, when it's metabolized by your body, it becomes formic acid and formaldehyde. So just as a point of reference, formic acid is what um, a specific kind of ants use to burn other uh, insects that are attacking them. And formaldehyde is what we use to preserve body parts. So neither one of those are things that you want on the inside of your body. Uh, if you drink methanol, you can end up with blindness, um, coma, or death. This is where the whole idea of moonshine blinding you comes from, because moonshine uh, one of if you're trying to make moonshine and you go wrong you can end up making methanol and not enough ethanol isopropyl alcohol is rubbing alcohol also toxic also toxic it's usually used as a solvent or cleaner or a disinfectant when you metabolize it becomes acetone which is nail polish remover um, but if you drink it it's not as serious as methanol it'll be very unpleasant um, if you drink a lot of it you can go into a coma but uh, other than that it just be wildly unpleasant don't drink either of these you can drink ethanol. If you're gonna drink ethanol, here are some of your options. Um, so this is a picture from the uh, textbook and it's just telling you, it's showing you how you have volume and then you have alcohol by volume and then you have eth ethyl alcohol per serving. So as you can see, one glass of wine equals one beer equals one shot of hard liquor. Um, and they have somehow decided to include wine coolers in this. I don't know anybody who drinks wine coolers. The last time I encountered a wine cooler, it was being used to uh, ice somebody at a party. So um, I don't know why they felt the need to include it, but it's there. Um, so as you can see, smaller amounts of wine or hard liquor have the same alcohol content as beer. So I think you guys probably saw something similar to this in your freshman uh, orientation where you learned about alcohol, right? So. We're first going to start off talking about pharmacokinetics. Uh, this is pretty important and extensive for alcohol. Then we're going to talk about pharmacodynamics, including mechanism of action and behavioral effects. Um, then we're going to talk about chronic effects of alcohol use, so long term, if you're drinking heavily for long periods of time, and then alco alcohol abuse and what we know about that. Um, when we talk about alcohol abuse, we'll also talk about why alcohol is reinforcing. But this is just going to be pharmacokinetics. So, um, there are a lot of different ways that you can take alcohol, and it has been taken in a lot of different ways through the years. So one of the first ways it was used uh, was as intramuscular. Um, well, not one of the first ways, but a way it used to be used is uh, as an intramus intramuscular injection. Um, it was found that you injected alcohol into people who are having uh, muscle spasms. It could relieve the ass. It could relieve the muscle spasms and reduce the intensity of the spasms. Um, so However, the antispastic periods of time became more brief with each subsequent injection. So there was a tolerance at this level, even though it's not having a psychoactive effect, it's not affecting um, like, you know, conscious behavior, uh, you can still build a tolerance to it. Um, so the, you had to figure out um, the dosing. Um, if you did it correctly, there were no adverse effects. It can also be used intravenously. Um, this is pretty much uh, when we were using alcohol as an analgesic, meaning a painkiller or an anesthetic, uh, it was sometimes given intravenously. Um, you can also inhale alcohol. I would really not suggest doing it. Uh, it's referred to as AWOL, alcohol without liquid. You can vaporize the alcohol using dry ice or heat the alcohol. Um, it turns the alcohol into a vapor and then you inhale it. Uh, alcohol gets into your bloodstream very, very quickly this way. It is very easy to overdose and it is not um, allowed in the U.S. It is illegal. Uh, but most of the time we think about alcohol, we think about people taking it orally, right? So the pharmacokinetics are basically alcohol enters the body uh, and it goes first to your stomach. Around 10% of the alcohol you consume gets into your bloodstream via the stomach. Uh, there's also, we'll talk about the enzymes that break down alcohol, but one of the, the first one is alcohol dehydrogenase. There is um, there are gastric levels of alcohol dehydrogenase. Men tend to have higher gastric levels than women. Um, if you have higher levels, less alcohol gets into your small intestine and you'll have a higher tolerance. 
small intestine, um, that is where 90% of the alcohol is going to enter your bloodstream. Uh, the small intestine is particularly, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, efficient at absorbing things. Uh, it has all those cilia, it has a large amount of surface areas, it is basically built to absorb nutrients, and while alcohol has no nutritional value, um, it's still uh, very easily absorbed. Um, so, and then it's going to be distributed by the heart through the blood, um, and it's going to have its psychoactive effect in the brain. Um, it is metabolized entirely by the liver. Um, it's about metabolized at a rate of about 0.5 ounces per an hour. Um, so, yeah. All right. So a lot of different things are going to affect how alcohol is absorbed into your body. Remember, we're talking about this is basically going to be an interplay between your stomach and your small intestine. So one thing is the rate of consumption. You drinking a beer with a buddy over half an hour or 45 minutes of talking is different from you like doing a beer bong and taking or shotgunning a beer, right? All of those are going to affect how the alcohol is absorbed. Um, it's also going to be about the condition of your stomach. If your stomach is empty, you will hit a quick, rapid buzz. Um, you'll have more rapid movement from the stomach to the small intestine, uh, and you will the alcohol is going to hit you faster. Um, if you eat with a full stomach, you'll end up with the delayed absorption effects, so the onset will be slower and more gradual, uh, and you're going to see for, su su uh, significant first-pass metabolism. This significant first-pass metabolism is mostly happening in the stomach by that alcohol dehydrogenase I mentioned that's in your gastric fluid. Um, so this varies by gender. Men have more than women. Um, it can also be affected by things like aspirin. So if you take an aspirin before the alcohol, more of it gets trapped in your stomach and you have a larger amount of, uh, yeah, you have a larger amount of absorption. Um, so carbonation can also increase absorption. Something about the bubbles um, speeds up the movement from the stomach to the small intestine. So this is sort of the idea behind champagne or mixing different liquors with um, carbonated beverages like a rum and coke. The other thing would be concentration of alcohol, right? So this is a graph that's showing you the sort of blood alcohol levels that we see in somebody with an uh, empty stomach versus somebody who's eaten something. As you can see, um, the empty stomach is going to jump a lot higher and a lot faster. This is the same amount of alcohol being consumed, but the timelines and the effects are very different. So this is an example where absorption is a very serious, like a very important factor to consider when consuming alcohol. So we haven't really talked that much about absorption um, in other in other drugs, other than the fact of its link between lipid solubility. But for alcohol, the um, the state of your internal state is going to have a big impact on absorption. Okay. So with distribution. Uh, it is alcohol is highly water soluble. It has low lipid solubility, but it's sufficiently lipid soluble in order to move through um, membranes. It is fairly easily absorbed um, and can move through the body fairly easily. It easily passes the blood brain barrier. 90% um, of the alcohol in your blood reaches the brain almost immediately. You don't lose a lot to the liver before it reaches the brain. It can also very easily pass the blood placental barrier. Um, so the fetus's blood alcohol level will be the same as the mother's. Uh, it's not titrated down. It doesn't lose any potency. Um, the blood alcohol level will be the same. Um, fetal alcohol syndrome is, this is why fetal alcohol syndrome is something we really want to think about. Uh, we'll talk about how alcohol interacts with NMDA. And one of the reasons why we see such cognitive defects in fetal alcohol syndrome is because of the um, down regulation of MD and MDA receptors that we see uh, in uh, fetuses with who've been exposed to alcohol. All right, so this is just a quick graph showing you uh, a quick figure showing you the alcohol metabolism that's happening in your liver. So ethanol is coming in um, and it's being processed by alcohol dehydrogenase. This is that enzyme that I mentioned is being in your stomach as well. That creates acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is broken down by aldehyde dehydrogenase, which becomes acetic acid, um, which is also known as vinegar. So uh, Acetic acid is not terrible to have in your system. Acetaldehyde is pretty nasty, and that's what leads to the level of hangover. It's also uh, different levels of these of these enzymes are going to result in different experiences of alcohol. So about 10% of the Asian population is a homozygous for the inactive form of aldehyde dehydrogenase, which means that when they consume alcohol, it gets 
metabolize into acetaldehyde and you have, um, in, you get flushing, you get really severe flushing, you get nausea, you get headache, you get an increased heart rate. So people with a homozygous for the inactive form of alcohol are going to really experience alcohol as an aversive event. It is not going to be pleasurable. It's going to be, it's going to hit them very hard and it's going to physiologically not feel good. Um, heterozygous, you get some of the same effects, but to a different extent, they often experience uh, more intense hangovers and have like, so a lower tolerance for alcohol. Um, but the vast majority of the population is homozygous for the active form, um, in which case you're going to take that acetaldehyde and make it into acetic acid fairly easily. These enzyme concentrations are also going to affect your vulnerability to liver disease, right? Another uh, enzyme that I wanted to mention that's important for uh, alcohol consumption is cytochrome. It's from the cytochrome P450 family. It's called CYP2E1. Uh, it's also referred to as the microsomal ethanol oxidizing system. One of the reasons I want to mention this is that oftentimes you'll see on drug labels, don't mix this with alcohol. Often it's because this enzyme, this CYP2E1, also metabolizes alcohol. So if you're, for example, taking antibiotic and alcohol and you are consuming alcohol, uh, but you've taken the antibiotic previously, the enzyme that would start breaking down the alcohol, this CYP enzyme that would usually start breaking down the alcohol would be occupied breaking down the antibiotic. So the alcohol is gonna hit you a lot stronger. Or if you drink alcohol before taking the antibiotic, you're not going to get the full effective dose of the antibiotic because it's going to be metabolized differently than anticipated. So that's often the case um, of why we're mixing, why some of those drugs say do not mix with alcohol. This is not the case for all. For example, with benzodiazepines, it's not about metabolism. It's about sharing a common molecular, tar molecular target. So when we talk about blood alcohol, um, when we talk about alcohol, I'm sorry, when we talk about intoxication, what you, the value that we use is blood alcohol concentration or BAC. First, the number of grams of alcohol per 100 milliliters of blood. You will have a higher tolerance if you have more blood in your body. So a large person um, who, uh, a large person can drink a beer and have a very different effect from a very small person who drinks the same amount of alcohol because the concentration in your blood is going to be higher. You consume the same amount of alcohol, but the blood amount, the denominator here, is going to be uh, much smaller, so it's going to hit you harder. It's expressed as a percentage. Um, so what's shown here um, is an example of a 175-pound man who drinks four 12-ounce cans of beer. He's going to be at 0.08 and legally intoxicated. You don't have to calculate this. We won't use it, but it's important to know how it's done. All right. So that's most of the pharmacokinetics. Uh, we'll get back to pharmacokinetics when we talk about tolerance and chronic effects, but the next video will be about pharmacodynamics and behavioral effects.